Butch Lumber, Mike, good to see you. Hope everybody's having a good week. We've had lots of rain in, in our area. That's uh, been a blessing. Well, and for others, uh, it's created some, some issues with the abundance of it. Today we are in uh, the book of Leviticus still. We'll be finishing that up shortly. Leviticus or Vaikra. It means and he called. And today's Torah portion is going to be the more. And um, I just want to also you know, mention about the uh, tragedy that happened in Israel and uh, encourage everyone to uh, be sure and pray for those folks that have, uh, especially those that have lost people and we've got people in the hospital and that. Uh, according to, uh, I believe, the Jerusalem Post or one of the articles that I saw, it said that, uh, I guess that was the worst peacetime disaster or one of the worst ones definitely in Israeli history. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, it's all, you know, I don't know if you guys know really what was going on there, but uh, Log the Omer, the 33rd day of counting of the Omer that we're in right now, it's tradition to go visit the uh, grave of, uh, um, sorry, name, his name just uh, slipped my mind, uh, Shem, uh, Shimon uh, Barkai. Yeah, uh, so sometimes when I get to talking and thinking, I can't think of words, but uh, Barkai, uh, that doesn't sound right. I don't know, sometimes, sometimes I just have these, uh, these moments, but. Uh, uh, a great, uh, a great catalyst and, and teacher, and uh, there, I remember a song that uh, one of the uh, bands that we used to listen to. There was a song about him, you know, that was kind of interesting. All right, Torah portion anymore. Anymore means say, and uh, I, I know that I've made uh, reference before how that. A lot of times in the Torah, there's there's distinctions in in things. It's not just synonyms, and really there's no synonyms. Everything is kind of a specific word. And so this one says, <clears throat> "Say." Sometimes it's speak, and sometimes, like a while back, we had a Torah portion called Tzav, very recently. And that means command. And we have one called, uh, back in Exodus, called Tetzave, that means you shall command. And so there's there's different uh, different levels of saying, speaking, commanding, and, and all of that. And this one's and more. And it begins in chapter 21 of Leviticus with, Hashem said to Moses, Say to the Kohanim, or the priest, the sons of Aaron, and tell them, each of you shall not contaminate himself for a dead person or to a dead person among his people, except for the relative who is closest to him, to his mother and to his father, to his son, to his daughter, and to his brother, and to his virgin sister who is close to him, who, shall, uh, who has not been wed to a man, to her shall he contaminate himself. A husband among his people shall not contaminate himself to one who desecrates him. They shall not make a bald spot on their heads, and they shall not shave an edge on their beard, and in their flesh they shall not cut a gash. They shall be holy to their God, and they shall not desecrate the name of their God. For the fire offerings of Hashem, the food of their God, they offer, so they must remain holy. They shall not marry a woman who is a harlot or who has been desecrated, and they shall not marry a woman who has been divorced by her husband, for each is holy to his God. You shall sanctify him, for he offers the food of your God. He shall remain holy to you, for holy am I, Hashem, who sanctifies you. If the daughter of a Cohen will desecrate, uh, will be desecrated through adultery, she desecrates her father, she shall be consumed by the fire. The Cohen who is exalted above his brethren, upon whose head the anointment oil has been poured out, who has been inaugurated to don the vestments, shall not leave his head unshorn and shall not rid his garment. So basically, the, the first part of this is going to talk about regular priest. <clears throat> We've talked about that before, how 
there's there's a lot of confusion, so it probably bears repeating that <clears throat> all priests are Levites, but not all Levites are priests. And so a lot of people think it's the same thing, but it's not. There were three families of the Levites that we'll get into talking about a little bit later in more detail in the book of Numbers or Bamethar, the tribe of or family of Gershon, the family of Merari, and the family of Kohat. And it's from the Kohat family that we end up with the Kohanim, or the priest. And within the priest, you know, you have these different functions. The priests are sons of Aaron, and then that's going to be narrowed down as we go further with, uh, like, for example, in the num book of Numbers, when we talk about Pinchas or Phineas, the priesthood begins to go through his line, and then ultimately uh, the sons of Zadok, and so on. And so, uh, and so a lot of these people who, who maybe start out in this line, then it, it becomes more, uh, more narrowed down for different reasons, uh, for, for good or for bad, I guess, as we go forward. So the first one is the scenario that's talking about are the laws associated with the Kohen, the priest. And then as I began to read a little bit further down, it's going to deal with the high priest, specifically or the Kohen Hagadol. So what, it, what this is talking about, and this is kind of an alien concept to Westerners, is that the idea of contamination from a dead body. And that if you come in contact, the Bible has much to say on that topic of contamination with a dead body and other types of contamination too that we've been spending some time on, on recently. And so if you have a, a regular priest, he can't, he can't just go to anyone's funeral and he can't, he's not afforded the luxury of mourning for just anyone. He, uh, it lists out seven different types of relationships that he can go to their funeral or mourn for. And it's tradition, you know, to uh, bury someone within 24 hours of the time that they die in the, uh, in the Jewish tradition, the tr Jewish religion. And uh, so the, the first one that is mentioned here, he, he shall, except for his relatives, okay, uh, he shall not contaminate himself to or for a dead person, except for the relative closest to him. That is understood to be his wife, and then the other is pretty well self-explanatory. So there's seven different relationships there. And these other types of uh, outward examples of, of uh, making bald spots or gashes in, in your flesh or, or your beard and that sort of thing. Uh, for the dead. All of this is like a, a desecration to the name of God. And uh, again, people don't really think about these kinds of things. I mean, of course, most people, even most uh, most believers, whatever constitutes that. Uh, but uh, I'm going to, let's, let's define it as people that really are, that are legitimate believers. Most of them are pretty ignorant of, of all of these kinds of passages and these concepts and, and they probably most of them have never even heard anything about contamination from the dead from dead things, dead people or other things, uh, or other types of contamination. I mean we're a we're a people immersed in content all kinds of contamination and are oblivious to it for the most part. And I I do remember mentioning a while back, like for example, and some of you might remember regarding Pesach or Passover, that uh, there's a couple of things that can prohibit you from celebrating the Passover festival. That if you're, well, if you're on a long journey, you're exempt from being there. Um, and then a, a second Passover is provided the next month. If, if, that's, your, if that's your reason, or if you were contaminated by a dead person but either one of those things you are not to if you're being contaminated by a dead body you're not supposed to eat the Passover and uh, or if you're you know again if you're on a long journey you're exempt from it and then a second Passover is provided and so there's 
this is dealing with uh, the priests or ministers and, and specifically because these things, I mean, this a lot of this would apply to regular people in terms of they can still be contaminated by it and by death, obviously, and they have, they can't access or participate in certain things until they've gone through that cleansing. And we'll get into, again, the book of Numbers, I keep referring to that, when we get into the laws of the red heifer, that's the purpose of that, is to purify from death contamination. And, uh, you know, that's something that just people don't, don't really, aren't very conscious of at all, is the contamination from death. But, uh, well, and I remember also mentioning regarding Passover in the New Testament, because probably still some of that thinking is in us at times, or people who acknowledge these things to be uh, valid and relevant. Nevertheless, I think still a lot of the cultural mindset and religious thinking still can have an effect, so you might think, well, but that's, you know, we're talking Old Testament stuff here, but, you know, Paul, Paul's about as New Testament as you get, and he talked about, for this cause, many are sick among you and some sleep, because they partook of the Passover in an unworthy state, and so, you know, this, these kinds of ideas were common knowledge, if you want to say that, at the, at the time, that uh, are not now. Then it's going to talk about the high priest in this scenario, and you'll see that he is not allowed to contaminate himself for anyone. You know, his wife, father, and mother, or anybody. A regular priest, you can go to a funeral, and you can, you know, you have some access to, to do that. I mean, that's when you really think about it, you put yourself in the position of uh, these people, you know, that you've got a real close friend that dies, but your your position is such that you're just not able to go show the respect for or your neighbor or whoever dies. You're a priest. You you just can't go. You can't you can't really mourn for them or go to their funeral or anything. And if you're a high priest, you can't for anybody. The the anointing on you is so, and, and, and we don't even get it of why would that matter, but it, it does. It would be a horrible desecration to God, and he, uh, he is in this great position of authority and mediator, and God's anointing is on him that for him to become contaminated through death, it would be uh, not only horrible for himself, but for the entire nation. And then what it's going to get into, well, it's, it's going to get into, actually, let's look at a little bit of this. In verse 16, Hashem spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron, and saying, Notice the redundancy of the Hebrew. Hashem spoke to Moses, spoke, saying, Speak to Aaron. So that's very characteristic of, of Hebrew that we see a lot of even in the New Testament. Any man of your offspring throughout your generations in whom there will be a blemish shall not come near to offer the food of his, his God. For any man in whom there will be a blemish shall not approach. And so uh, that's the word approach there has to do with come near the 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 uh, caparet, the, uh, the veil, the veil, paracat, sorry, boy, I'm, I'm having trouble this morning. The veil, the paracat. And, uh, okay, for any man in whom there is a blemish shall not approach a man who is blind or lame or whose nose has no bridge or who has one limb lo longer than the other or in whom there will be a broken leg or a broken arm or who has abnormally long, long eyebrows or a membrane on his eye or a blemish in his eye or a dry skin eruption or a moist skin eruption, or has crushed testicles, any man from among the offspring of Aaron the colon who has a blemish shall not approach to offer the fire offerings of Hashem. He has a blemish. Now, they can, he goes on to say, the food of his God from the most holy and from the holy may he eat. So, he can still eat of these things that's given to the priest, but he is not able to himself 
to carry out the services if he has any of these blemishes here. And, you know, there's different ways to look at this because if you if you think about it, I mean, if some guy, I mean, can, can, the, can the man really help most of these things, what his nose looks like, or what is, you know, if he's born with uh, one leg longer than the other or blind or, you know, was it blind and, uh, or lame? I don't guess it mentions deafness, and I don't know if that is understood to be included rabbinically or not, but it, uh, I don't think that, you know, if, if these other things would exclude someone because they can have, I get, you know, certain types of imperfections, perhaps, if it wasn't, if it wasn't much, but certain of these blemishes would prevent from some, someone from serving as a high priest or as a regular priest, either one. Then it's going to get in a little shortly thereafter in discussing the offerings, and it's going to be a similar thing. A lot of these sim, uh, characteristics are mentioned regarding the offerings too. What is not acceptable to offer up, as we see here in, uh, let's see, let me just jump over there. In verse 17 of chapter 22, Hashem spoke to Moses saying, Speak to Aaron to his sons and all the children of Israel and said to them, any man of the house of Israel and of the proselytes among Israel who will bring his offering for any of the vows or the free will offerings that they will bring to Hashem for an ele elevation offering to be favorable for you, it must be unblemished, male from the cattle, the flock, or the goats. In any which, uh, in any which there is a blemish you shall not offer, for it will not be favorable for you. And a man who will bring a feast peace offering to Hashem because of an articulated vow or a free will offering from the cattle or the flock, it shall be unblemished to find favor. One that is blind or broken or with a split eyelid or a wart or a dry skin eruption or moist skin eruption, you shall not offer one that has an ox or sheep that has one limb longer than the other or unsplit hooves. It can be a donation, but it is not accepted for a vow offering. And so you'll see that it's a lot of the same qualities of the person that will be offering up the offering and the offering itself. So they, they can't have blemishes. So, you know, when you begin to kind of probe and think about this a little bit further, there's not, right now, the offerings aren't going on. At the, you know, there's not a temple and the offerings aren't going on and, and that sort of thing. So it seems like something probably not very relevant for us right now. But uh, what are we, you know, when, a lot of times when you start breaking things down, things be in a very simple way, like maybe a child would, if you start asking questions, you say, okay, the colon here, the priest, that uh, says in verse 18 of chapter 21, for any man in whom there is a blemish shall not approach a man who is blind, lame, uh, his nose has no bridge, one limb longer with no. What do all those things have in common? It wasn't Sesame Street or one of those shows or three of these things are not like the other kind of thing? And, and, or certain games, I guess, that we've played before. What's the, what is the, uh, the game that Juno designed or, or often does? Where are you? Huh? Game third. Yeah, uh, yeah, she, I guess there's three things listed and you've got to name the thing that it's related to or something, how they connect. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if I do that, if I say blindness, lameness, warps, blemishes, broken bones, all of that, you know, a, a nose problem, it's got to do with the body, doesn't it? That's pretty simple. All of those things have to do with the body, right? And so, in the New Testament, that language is used quite a lot. Uh, the body of Christ, and, you know, it talks about, uh, and if the your eye offend you, you know, cast it out. It's better that the, if you, you cast it out uh, than the whole body. 
end up in Hades, or I think I think it's Hades there instead of Gehenna, but I can't remember. Um, and you know, the eye shall not say to the hand that I don't need you, and vice versa. So there's a lot of this language in the the New Testament, particularly, that deals with the body and the different parts of the body and how those things in the ideal body of, of Messiah, all of those individual parts are functioning properly and they're working in harmony and unity together. And so this is a, we can look at it this way, and I believe probably the writers of the New Testament again, because the, these guys knew the Torah quite well, when they looked at an area like this, that's probably what they're going to be thinking about. They're not just going to be thinking about physical defects and deformities. They're going to see that there's a spiritual picture here that points to, you can look at it as an individual because these physical defects are physical symbols or manifestations of spiritual defects. Okay? And so, on an individual, like within each of us individually, what blemishes do we have or flaws that would disqualify us from service to God or certain types of service? And uh, so, well, I mean, Yeshua talked about in even referring to teachers, particularly about blind leading the blind, you know, in somebody with a, a knowledge of Torah, and probably a lot of those were priests, knew that, were they physically blind? No, probably not. But uh, they were they were spiritually blind, and they weren't in a, that's a major a defect that makes it pretty difficult for a, per, a blind person to intercede or minister to God, the God of Israel on behalf of the people. And I believe when you begin to look at these individual, part of it has to do with sight, part of it has to do with your walk. If your walk is imbalanced, that you got, if you've got one leg longer than the other or something like that, then your walk is not very consistent and balanced. So there's inconsistency in like, we, uh, we talk about pretty often, or maybe reference, halakha, uh, which is the word halakha basically means uh, the, way, the way you walk from the word, uh, what is it, from, from the word halak and yalak that has to do with the way one walks. And so it's, uh, it's an idiom. For the way you work out and keep the commandments of God is halakha of how the halakha of the Sabbath. How do you go about keeping the Sabbath holy and that sort of thing? And so that has to do with well, and even um, I can think of so many places in Scripture that refer to the different types of body, the types of the body that seven things that God hates and that sort of thing. A proud look, do with the eyes, you know. Hands that shed innocent blood, feet that are quick to run into to mischief, and all, all of these things that have to do with different parts of the body that are defective. And uh, so the scripture, particularly with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, because um, Yeshua said that the comforter, when he comes, that he will he'll guide you in all truth and show you things to come. And in, in, in one place, I believe it's in the book of John, it says that he'll basically illuminate all things to you. And he begins to connect connect the dots. for, And so we can begin, we're not left in the dark because we have, we have the scriptures and we have the leading of the Holy Spirit. We've got the example of the Messiah and, and many other people. And he can begin to knit a lot of these things together in a lot of these passages and... Uh, we can begin to see, what does it talk about, that it's like a mirror, or it's like looking at a glass darkly, and, you know, the book of James talks about that a double-minded man, like is somebody who, be you hearers of, doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves, 
And somebody that does that is like somebody who looks in the mirror and turns around and walks away and forgets they're not able to hold that image, proper image in their mind of what they should be or of the, the word here. And uh, so, you know, I would, uh, it might be good to, to think about those things and to, to think about and ask God and, and pray all of us, for all of us do that, to humble ourselves and to ask God to reveal to us what blemishes we have. And we even, you know, a while back, we when we looked at uh, the laws of leprosy or tsara'at or the laws of the mitsora, someone who had what what is rendered as leprosy, and we talked about that a while back, that that's not actually the malady that's being discussed here, but that's the way it's usually translated. <clears throat> we looked at that contamination, which is really bad, because they were... Uh, at least these people that are, if you've got one of these defects, you can still eat of those sacrifices in certain situations. You just can't offer them up. You can't be a representative. You can't be, you can't function as a, a, a religious leader, as a priest, but you can, you can eat of these things. But, uh, Leprosy or Tsara on the other hand, of the Mitsura, you were banished. You couldn't even be a part of the community at all anymore. You were banished to outside of the gates. And so, which reminds me, and it begins to talk also about a number of things about these nocturnal emissions, uh, contamination by uh, women's contamination and male contamination that was talked about in a previous tour portion a while back. We've been dealing with a lot of things. So you've got these different types of physical blemishes, blindness, lameness, uh, issues with other issues with the eye where maybe you're not completely blind, but you've got a blemish in your eye. That a couple of that are that are mentioned here. Um, and all of these things, you know, are, are indicative of spiritual issues and spiritual problems. And the, like in, in the Gospels, you know, we have the, uh, the situation, the little lady with the issue of blood that had the issue of blood for 12 years. And she was in a perpetual state of uncleanness for 12 years. That she could, she was limited in, she couldn't touch holy things. One of our Torah portions last week was Kiddoshim. And so we've been going through all of these different things in lessons of holiness to, to awaken us and to enlighten us, to grant us discernment and to be able to recognize the difference between good and evil, between, which might be a good time to stop. Most people assume that they understand the difference between good and evil. Most people don't. Uh, everybody thinks that they understand those things. They think that they understand the difference between clean and unclean and pure and contaminated, but they don't. And so without the, the Torah, as a matter of fact, and we know that the Torah is spiritual, Paul said, that he said, I wouldn't know what sin was except for by the Torah. Sin is missing the, the mark, and sin ultimately leads to death, which is some real bad contamination. You know, all these are different levels of contamination, different kinds. The uh, the guy, the lady with the issue of blood, or the man with the running issue of uh, of a male situation. There, uh, both of those have to do with uh, life running out of the person. Their life is being drained out of them all the time. We, we see that life is in the blood, but also the seed is life too. And so those things, rather than producing like, like they should, you've got an un, <clears throat> unproductive life in both of those cases. And you've got your life is being drained out of you every day, and you can't stop that cycle that leaves you in a perpetual state of contamination. And so the, uh, the Tzara'at, for instance, when we looked at it, 
and I didn't really have time to get off into that. But uh, all of those things kept you from the presence of God. If you think about the temple complex and, and moving closer and closer to God's presence, the more of the, these types of problems you have, and some of them prevented you from being connected to the people of God or God himself. <clears throat> and, and both of those things, if you were disconnected from God, then you're also disconnected to, a, to an extent from the people. When you look at a place like Revelation 22, it says, uh, verse 14, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. So, <clears throat> the commandments, obedience to the commandments, is one of the ways that gives you access through the gates or through the portals. And we see and to the a right to the tree of life, man was driven out of the garden. This is very much Garden of Eden language here. His disobedience caused him to be expelled and exiled from the Garden of Eden, the first temple. The Garden of Eden was a temple. You had, and God planted a garden eastward within Eden. And then it refers to the midst of the garden, which we end up, it's just like the outer court, the inner court, the holy place, and the holy of holies, or it's just like Ham, Shem, and Japheth. We're shown these pictures, the sons of Noah, in a lot of different ways, spirit, soul, body. All of this, because we're looking at a body in these different parts. All of these symbols were, were shown in a number of different ways. So you get access through obedience here, verse 14, for without, outside of what? Without what? The gates. And we've been looking at that a mitzora, someone with sorry, uh, leprosy, they were outside of the gates. Or these, these people with um, certain types of issues were not allowed to go anywhere near the, the temple or, any, or touch or have anything to do with anything holy. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loves and makes a lie. This is one of the last things mentioned in Revelation right toward the very end of the 22nd chapter in the, in the Bible. So outside of the gates are these types of people that have spiritual leprosy or other types of defects that prevent them from being allowed access into this city through these gates. If you are, these are contaminated people, okay, that we're reading about here in Revelation uh, 22, 15. These people are spiritually contaminated because of the way they live and because of what they are. And it, you know, it's interesting that it ends that way with whosoever loves and makes a lie. And I bet you I could go pretty much anywhere and talk to people from different denominations or atheists or agnostics or probably every religion. Conservatives, liberals, I think I could talk to people on an individual level or big groups of people and say, how many of you all out there Love and make lies. Is there anybody out there who loves and makes lies? I don't think that anybody would be honest or discerning enough to raise their hand. But probably nearly every single one of them do. Because a lot of times we're, we're, we're get, we brush up against the truth. There are things in life that, the, like the, the stuff I'm reading here and, and all of these passages I'm referring to um, about different types of situations or relationships in your life that reveal and reflect different blemishes back to you. Like, um, you know, again, I think I mentioned it a while back, Snow White and the, the, uh, the witch in the story who 
would look into her mirror, her magic mirror, and say, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? And her, her magic mirror would reflect back to her the reality that she wanted for a while. She it did. And then one day, the mirror reality, let's say, stopped reflecting back the reality that the witch wanted. And so she became, rather than work on herself, to where, if, if possible, that she could make the her idealized image match reality closer and, and try to uh, diminish that gap. Instead, she focuses her animosity upon Snow White, the one who had less blemish or whatever, or that she, she ended. And so, you know, it's interesting, a lot, of, whether a lot of the fairy tales or the different stories in the, the Bible, if we begin to look at that, this is what, I remember uh, my art teacher one time, I was talking about, well, it seems like the more I practice at this stuff, the, the more flaws I see in what I'm doing, you know, that I, and I tend to, to do that, probably a lot of people do, it's something they make or maybe something they play, uh, probably a lot of musicians or the audience might think it's great, and the musician is conscious of the wrong note or chord that they hit, or the artist that uh, the people like a pain that the artist did, and the artist sees the things that are wrong with it, or that he that he's not happy with, that he felt like were not could have been better or something, and which is you know you can go too far with that too. But I remember my. Uh, Instructor said, and maybe other people have said that, like out here, if I hold my hand out here, maybe, and it may look clean, if I've been out working in the dirt, maybe in the garden, my hand might look clean. But first, the closer I bring it to the light, the more I will notice the dirt or the contamination on my hands, and the more it will probably tend to bother me that I want to be clean of that and cleanse it. But the further we are away from the light, thy word is a lamp and the feet the light to the I am the light of the world and you are to be lights in the world. So the closer, if we keep bringing our set, moving toward the light and being inspected in the light, we're gonna notice things more. If you find, if you look for shelter in the darkness, you're, you're going to look okay yourself. You're going to be more and more you're comfortable with, with who and what you are the further away from the light you are. It's just very much like a, a, a reference it quite a lot in Matthew 25, the parable of the, the sheep and the goats, that you've got this one group. Both groups have a distorted sense of identity and self. Their self-image is distorted, both of those groups. The one group thinks that they're better than they really are. And then ultimately with the ultimate truth and light, it's reflected back to them the truth of who and what they really are. The other group is actually better than they think they are. They see themselves as they see their flaws and what where they don't measure up more but the Messiah sees them as better than they see themselves. And both of them had a distorted sense of, of who they and what they were. And so I think that's an important thing. And that this thing right here is just quite scary when you think about that those who love and make a lie. I mentioned darkness. You know, and when we look at the way those ideas of darkness are used in the Bible, well, it says, you know, if the eye is dark, the whole body is. I mean, if the, the eye has a major blemish, see, an, an eye is a, can be a type of leader, like uh, the prophets were called seers initially. Eyes. So, like, if, as part of the body, if you've got a prophet or leader that is causing the rest of the body to... Uh, end up in contamination or corruption. It's better, even if as important of a thing as that is, that it's removed than for the whole body to be destroyed, contaminated. 
you know, it's what you should, he's not telling people to pull, pull their eyeballs out of their head, you know, but, uh, but there is a personal application of that too. If your, your, your greatest talent, your greatest characteristic is you can't keep it between, between the lines or on the rails and it's causing you to be contaminated, it's better that you get rid of even that most precious thing then the whole thing be lost, you know? And so this love and make a lie, the people that do that, and we all have at different times, on different levels, anytime you justify yourself, like you have some sort of conflict or issue or whatever, um, I don't, I don't want to be too specific, but I remember a, a story, a person in our congregation years ago uh, was talking about, I think it's okay to say it, uh, but this person was really mad in recounting a situation that they were at church and the person, a person with him, I guess, was being disruptive. And so the usher came over and said, guy is telling the story to us and he's getting mad all over reliving it uh, and he's like and I was so mad that uh, that they said that to her and uh, you know kind of like who does he think he is coming over here and saying that to her and I'm like he did what he should have done you're the one out of order you're just dis you're disrupting the service and you're mad because he called you on it and all he all he did is nice. Ask you just, can you keep it down? You're, you you shouldn't need to be in here conversing anyway. I mean, you, you ought to be listening, and other people are trying to listen. You're disrupting. So his version of it, they walked out of there justified in their minds. That and it's a blindness. They they loved and made the lie that they were justified, and the other guy was the bad guy. And probably all of us have done that at a certain point. Maybe, maybe the boss told you to do something, gave you specific instructions, and you thought that you would do it another way because maybe you think that you know better about it or whatever. And so the, the boss jumps on you or you lose your job or there's some negative consequences about it. How do you frame it? Well, the boss is a jerk. The boss is, a, is an idiot. And you, you drive home justified in your mind because it's his fault. Never again, jurisdictionally, you work for him. And the, the Bible gives a lot of different scenarios like that. And so a person who, and, and there's a danger for every one of us, if, if you're human, to, love, to create lies and love them. Uh, mistruths, falsehoods, distortions, whatever you want to call it, about who and what you are and why you do what you do and why you don't do what you do and why others do. And to our world is full of spin and distortion on the right and on the left. And the conservatives love and make lies and the liberals love and make lies. They, like, they love to leave out information that does not help their cause, and they love to focus in on information on the other. If there's a sex scandal on the one side, it's a horrible deal, and that person should be removed. If it's on your side, most people are just, they're, they don't, well, so did they, or again, some sort of justification rather than being consistent. Or, you know, the the behavior of conservative kids versus liberal kids. Uh, uh, Gerald was telling us a story earlier, and I remember uh, seeing uh, videos of the protesters and these little bitty kids, and they were having, them, having these little toddlers say F Trump. And, uh, you know, a lot of the, uh, you know, people with any kind of sense were uh, just appalled at that. But then, 
a lot of people, you know, on the conservative side were okay with it when a little boy said that to Biden, about Biden, you know, and it's just, it's, uh, we can't love and make lies, even if it, it helps our side. Uh, the scripture talks about agree with your adversary quickly. And the truth doesn't, the truth is the truth, and that should be our side, not not political or de denominations or anything like that. Our ultimate loyalty should be to the truth. And people just don't value it. We were talking earlier on the way up here about, like, how many people, how many believers can, can stay focused for 10 minutes or 15 minutes, much less an hour, uh, on this kind of content? Or how many, can, how many believers, so-called believer, whatever, however you want to define that, crack open their Bible during the week and read it all, ever. Uh, and of them, how many of them ever do any, any study? And of them, how many of them ever take it deeper than that? And uh, so, you know, we know every time, year to year, all the time we have, uh, you probably invited people to different functions or, or you send them a video maybe and say, hey, check this, out, you know, this, you might find this interesting. It talks about prophecy or talks about the peace or it talks about the Sabbath and, uh, probably they're not going to have time for it, you know, and, you know, you should come to, uh, Sukkot. You should come check out Sukkot this year. Well, I, can't, I really, you know, probably they will, most people will find it. And I'm talking about messianics. I'm talking even about them. A lot of people that talk about the Torah, and they talk about the Sabbath, and they talk about Passover and all of them, and somehow every festival just about, something happens to come up, and they're never there, or almost never there, and year after year after year after year, and uh, so after a while, but, you know, uh, with your time, your calendar, your, there's all things sorts of things that highlight what your actual values are. And a person, these things are to teach us holiness from contamination. And in order to get it, you're going to have to stop being like the culture. Is there any, I remember John Hagee years ago, I don't agree with a lot of what he says, but this I thought was pretty good. He said, speaking to his audience, he said, if you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And you could say that. Uh, if you were on a trial about, let's just say, for being a follower of Yeshua, being a, a lot of people call themselves Torah observant, if you were on trial for being Torah observant, would there be enough evidence to convict you or follower of the Messiah? For a lot of people, I just don't think that there, it would be there. But because what they, what they think about what they say, what they eat, where they spend their time, and what they spend their money on is the same as the culture. There's really very little difference in a lot of time. We were marveling in our little town this past week. Uh, a Taco Bell opened up. I think our population in, in Sulphur is around 5,000, I think. Now, we've got, like, I mean, it's a little town. We've got quite a few places to eat. I don't know how many Mexican restaurants we have in town, but uh, I think about four Mexican restaurants, or maybe, and then we've got a Taco Mayo, and now this week we've got a Taco Bell. And uh, the police had to, I don't know if they set up barricades or something, there was all kinds of traffic chaos, lines of people in there, to get to Taco Bell. And I've seen that with other places that open up and so forth. You know that every one of those people have eaten at Taco Bell before. A lot, probably. and But they were all driven to go to Taco Bell and wait in line and wait out in the street to go to stupid Taco Bell. And you, when you look at some of the dumb things that people will wait in line for and plan, and they're not going to miss it, People that won't, can't make it to Passover made it to Taco Bell. And they will see that they do because that is truly their value. 
but they love and make a lie that their values are something different than that. And it's pretty important, I think, that we begin to, you know, really be honest with ourselves and, try, and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to us our true values and what are our true, what are our true vices, what are our true virtues, what are our true blemishes and defects and those kinds of things. Because just because we're used to it and just because we're far, we're away from the light far enough that we look pretty good and we we're, and we especially think that we look good compared to other people maybe, but it, it doesn't talk about that. It just doesn't say if your your leg is not as bad as somebody else or your, your blemish and your eyeball is not as bad as other people. It still will prevent people from um, being able to serve in that capacity. In this Torah portion today, in chapter 23, if you want to learn a little bit about the festivals, the Moedim, Moedai, the appointed times of God and his Mikra Kodesh, it'll give you um, some information on that. And notice it gives, uh, I believe it gave more information about Sukkot than it did anything else. But when we kind of look at all this, I was kind of wondering what, what runs through all this. And there is a weird, there's a weird passage about blasphemy that fits into this too. That this uh, son of uh, Egyptian, Egyptian had a son, and it was a Israeli mother, and she, he got in a fight with this uh, other Israelite, and uh, this uh, son of the Egyptian blasphemed, and uh, they're trying to figure out what to do, and. Ultimately, Moses said to take him out and have, have him stoned to death. And I think a lot of times there's blasphemy. We are so corrupted and contaminated in our society and so been so far from the light and so our vision so poor at discerning clean from impure and good from evil and all of those things. The, the scriptures have to teach you that. And the Holy Spirit has to be able to teach you, help you sharpen your discernment Otherwise, you don't know. You could be in a situation of being a, a, an absolute desecration to God's name and not even know it. Be totally oblivious to it. Because you and you don't even, you know, you don't even think about these, the being contaminated by sin and death and these different blemishes that cause you to even, if you do certain of these things, uh, you can be taken out of this life early. In this passage, if you if you look at it, certain things it says will will you will be cut off, carrots in uh, in Hebrew. There's different forms of that. In other passages, uh, it's what this is understood to be in a lot of cases is that God Himself removes you from the earth of the the cutting off to an extent extent. You know, and we have. I was thinking also on the way up here. I am the vine. You are the branches. My, fa my father is the vine dresser. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so that it can bear more fruit. Every branch that does not bear fruit, he cuts off. And there's a lot of um, references to that type of thing of being cut off or cut off from the congregation and that sort of thing. And so if you bring in certain types of contaminations and uncleannesses with you, it can be fatal for, for the person or even the whole nation. I won't go into the festivals today because I have before. If you do have any questions about any of that, we can try to answer them for you. But I'm going to go ahead and stop now because I think I've gone plenty long. And hopefully you guys will join us again next week. Shabbat Shalom. Hope you have a great week.